Uh, my name is John Pope. I joined RCA May, May the 15th, 1950. I had answered an ad in newspaper for a production supervisor. So I hired on as production supervisor in the, in the, in the home instrument division. Electric components, electronic components, mm -hmm. components for TV and radio, etc. My first job as supervisor was on a night shift with about, uh, I'd say, 60, 70 people uh, winding what they call deflection coils that went around the neck of the, uh, the tube, mm -hmm. the TV tube, and uh, had the winding operation, and also we used to press the coils to form and so forth. And I started night shift, and it was uh, an experience as far as uh, the people worked for me, uh, but they were uh, the people, the workers were very good. It was incentive, so everybody, you know, was uh, supposed to make their rate every. So things were involved as far as making your rate every day and so forth. And uh, so I, uh, I thought the, we had a good association with, with people that. I can, I'd like to express something about some of these people that worked there it was, that was all new to me. The, uh, the women on, on, their, on their lunch hour, maybe they had a half hour lunch hour and they stayed in a position, they set up an empty position with food. And everyone was invited, including the supervisors. And uh, also they, there were several parties at nighttime at Mary's. That's, uh, that's a bar that was out near the, uh, the racetrack circle years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, uh, so the people were, were very good workers and they, uh, if you treated them fairly, they were good to you. And they were, in fact, as a matter of fact, at Christmas time, I was there this one Christmas, the first Christmas, and the, uh, they, uh, they were one of the people, I forget which one it was, one of the girls brought in a case of beer for me as a Christmas present. I don't know how they got it in there, but you know. And the other thing was in that period of time, which I thought was very interesting is, I was only, uh, when, the, when vacation came up, they usually shut down for two weeks in components. You know, I wasn't entitled to vacation because I was just hired. And uh, they, they gave me a job out in 24 building, where they were building fair rights for the two weeks. And that was very good for me because I really needed to work at the time. And uh, so, the, so I was, that was the component division and I uh, learned a lot there. There was a lot of interaction between, well, that's not the end of components because after the first year, they transformed me to transformer department. And I had a background in transformers. I had worked with my father developing transfer electrical coil wound winding business and transformers. And that was also another, and I was in charge of the lead dress and laminating of the power transformers. And the, uh, the single winding of it, and the prime and the, the multiple layer winding was another section. And the people there, particularly the group leader, Marie Carr, excellent group leader. The supervisor in those days, if they had a good supervisor, a good a group leader, it was, it was excellent, it was, you know, we became kind of friends. We, she enjoyed uh, Parker when we got to visit her with my family, I had a young family. At that time, I think it was uh, four children, or at one time, yeah, four children, and uh, down the shore, so it was nice. And the other thing about, it, about Marie and her people worked for me, when the twins were born in 1953, they had a, they got everybody together and they gave me a two $25 war bonds for the twins. Which, Who you gave know, that to you? The, 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 everybody worked for me. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah they got together, shipped in, and uh, and uh, so they never forgot that. And, 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 and you know, the kids kept them for years. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also was, uh, were, we got along as a family there. Uh, particularly, I had a, I formed a, uh, I was, a, I formed a baseball team, softball, with the, with the guys in that, in you know, in that department, and we played in the uh, the RSA League softball league, and uh, 
They're all, and we had two shop stores here, Joe Simpson and Bill Jenkins, and uh, both of them played on our team, you know. And like, and I even, like one time I remember being invited by Joe to stop off the union while we had to work, you know, just to, you know, talk. We never talked work, you know, maybe talk baseball and so mm -hmm. forth, but, and Joe, Joe was my pitcher. And uh, he was a little wild at times. I used to catch. When I played softball, I used to catch. And uh, it, was, it was a very, very rewarding, and everybody got along. Uh, I got to know a lot of people, and uh, and uh, and I thought it was a very, a very family, a very good family atmosphere. And then around that time, there was a Victor AA Association that had parties at different times, picnics and so forth, you know, through the years. Mm -hmm. And that was another place that uh, you could get together and talk, you know. And twice you used the term family. Yeah. Um, are you suggesting that? There was an RCA family? Yeah, it was an RCA family. In fact, the paper was called the RCA family, paper, newspaper, I think, you know. And it was, but they did it. That, in that time, it was like a family, right? They treated everybody with, with trying to treat everyone, you know, nicely and evenly. Even, even the negotiations with the union, and even when you had to give notices to people, right? If you, if you knew your job as an example, a supervisor, line supervisor's job, he, you know, goes so far with reference to the people's working for him that if someone doesn't make the rate and it contingency don't, there's a formal way of doing it. You write a written, written record of notice, and it's what goes down on the record. And then another, another third written notice is out of your hands, right? So someone else decides about you know, upper management and upper union management decides so what to do about this problem, you know, whatever the problem was. You know, production problem or something else with relation to an operator, mm -hmm. and uh, we had a lot of. I learned one thing there uh, from one of one of my one of the people I managed one time. I think his name was Al Aigner. He, he was my manager, and uh, I remember I remember him uh, him and I talking one time, and he was talking about dealing with union stewards, and he said something like, "John, you have to remember that they're just like you. They're." They're, they're managing their people, you know, they're supervising their people, their union people. So you have to show them the same respect, you know. And I think that goes a long way in dealing, you know, with union management relations. And I, yeah, that, was, uh, that was the component division. I worked there for five years. And uh, they were going to go to Ohio, Finley, Ohio, they built a new plant. And they were going to Ohio because they couldn't make any money because union rates were going up. They were saying they were losing money. And so they started up this new plan in Finley. And uh, it was kind of enticing, but uh, I was, they wanted me to go out there. And I didn't, I said, no, I don't, because I didn't want to get out there. Because if I saw the new plan, I might, you know, think it was a good thing to do. But I wanted to keep the family together in this area, right? And at that time, we had, I think, four children. <laughs> And uh, so I didn't go to Finley, and they, Al Wagner, who was my boss at the time, he, he got me transferred to Morristown in the radar business. And the radar was, business was just starting up. I got there in 55. The guy who had windows of foreman there, and there was a lot of uh, people from Canada starting to work there. They, uh, you know, supervision, management people, because the business, radar business was just starting up. And I was in on the beginning of the instrumentation radar. And at that time, I think around that time, the first system was sent to Cape Canaveral, you know, for tra tracking the, the satellites that were going to be shot. And uh, that also was a kind of family oriented uh, and, uh, and, dealing with, and dealing with the stewards. And uh, things, were, things were about the same far, same thing as far as dealing with people, except had a lot less people working for you. You maybe had 10 people in a line building boxes, AIC-10, MG-10, you know, electronic communication boxes and so forth, and large cables, interconnecting cables, etc. And But you had 10 people rather than, say, 50 people, and it was an incentive. So you depended a lot on, the, on as a supervisor, on your setup man and your instructor, you know, and your repair people and so forth, you know. 
Uh, and uh, so that uh, that was a little different, and uh, I was doing okay on that. And uh, but there was an influx of supervisors uh, coming in, and I could see that there wasn't much, you know, chance. You know, I want to, you know, get going right. And uh, I was there maybe a year or two, and uh, I called my old boss Edgar and said, "Is there any openings?" He said, "Yeah, I have one down in Deptford, right?" So I says, okay, but he called my boss, my boss's boss, Bill Butler, and uh, I guess to tell him. Next thing I know, they, they give me a promotion. Hmm. And I think about, uh, about a year after that or less, uh, they asked me to go up to personnel and set up a training program for the wiremen, you know, and, uh, you know, set the uh, reading blueprints and wiring and so forth, and we I did that. and. Came back and taught it for a while. You know, I remember when I went back to the system area where they were shipping the systems out. That I guess there was about this rotation made our system. That I guess it was 15 cabinets, and where you integrate the chassis and all the cable and so forth. Went back there, and uh, and then I guess uh, about 58. Uh, my boss, not my boss's boss, Butler took a. Took a job being the first manufacturing manager on a, on a on a project, and this was the BMUSE project, ballistic missile early warning system. And he asked me to go up with him. So I made the decision to go up because, like the next step up would be, be general foreman, right? But that would all be the same stuff all over again, right? But now I figured this is something new, you know. So I went up with Butler, and uh, we started up on uh, and it involved uh, setting up. Uh, instructions and writing programs and, and they really got into working with engineering that's how we really started working with engineering the project engineer and design engineering and you know and we do uh, and we worked with the subcontractors dealt with the sites it was a site in Greenland that uh, was having problems one time and they wanted me to go out there and I figured I don't want to you know travel a thousand miles of ice to get there so we had we had a radio kind radio system set up, and I had a fellow who worked who worked for me who worked you know just directly with them on all their problems. So you know, so we did that kind of stuff, and I guess that was like a couple of years, and uh, a lot of new things came up. We were able to do the the uh, they set up that big ball outside the Morristown yeah. plant, and uh, for the tracking radar, and uh, that was neat going up and. My my boss uh, had a lot. Of, he, he 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 was pretty pretty quick. He said to me one day, you know, we ought to talk to personnel about, you know, about the fact that you're going to have a lot of unions in there. You're going to have company unions. You're going to have outside unions, right? And you do want to hold up, you know, mm -hmm. for this project. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I guess around sixty. Uh, Bill, Bill, Al, Mar Al Marconi, Marconi was the vice president, mm -hmm. and he was very good. He had a hard, he had a good reputation, but also very tough. And uh, so he had, evidently Bill was one of his boys or something. You know, like he called on people who knew how to get things done, and uh, called on Builder because Heightstown was having the problem with a, a company called Sonatone. They're making a power cell for the Nimbus satellite, and uh, and then Bill went up and, and he came back and he, and he talked to me about it and he said that uh, you know what, what could be done and so forth. So we were assigned to go to Sonatone. Bill and I went to Sonatone, and uh, we talked to the people and we started. Uh, he started working on bringing other people up for it. They said had some kind of material problem. Brought a guy up from Morristown. Follow that vendor and make sure we got that and make sure we get this. And I worked on the assembly floor. And I, I sort of, uh, you know, started running the assembly floor, right? You know, or, you know, was involved a lot. And we used to get in there every morning before anybody. And when we <laughs> come down, so, and one day on the assembly floor, and it was a problem and no one would work on Saturday, you know, in this particular area. And the shop store couldn't get them to work, the supervisor couldn't get them to work. So I said, Neymar, if I talk to them, right? So I talked I to talk them, I started waving the flag about the, how important the Nimbus program was, right? You know, mm -hmm. the space program. 
and they worked, right? Cool. And uh, so the, uh, but then they caught up with us, Steve. We called in the office, we came in one day and the guard said, let's start escorting us to the president's office, right, you know? So we got there and uh, he was a very nice gentleman. He, uh, he said, he, he appreciated everything we did, he said, but you know, he said, you're getting your work, but we're not getting anything else out of here. So you're going to have to leave. <laughs> really? Plus, Bill wrote a, I think Bill wrote a letter, I don't remember it, kept the letter, but he wrote a letter to Mal Corny and copied the present. I wasn't too, it wasn't too nice about, you know, Sonic Tone, right? So I think it sort of motivated it. Mm -hmm. uh, got, and so we got back to, uh, oh, we, uh, so we got back from Worthtown, I guess it was a week or so, and Bill brings me in his office and has a big flip chart there, and he starts telling me about he was, Went up the heights down, and they got this kind of management problem. He's got every, all the all the things, all the blocks up there, you know. All the well, you know, this guy does this, this guy does that. And he says we have to go up there and get it started because they have these about eight eight satellite programs. We're not getting any production, and they had schedules to meet. And uh, and we up and it, it was a, like more of a, more of a model shop operation. They were not familiar. Engineering wasn't familiar with schedules. So one of the first things they did that Bill set up was uh, set up a, a schedule. And I think well, it was Sid Sternberg was the chief engineer. I think it was SS1 or something, yeah. That was the name of the schedule. And then we went around and scheduled each engineering department, you know, based on what work they had and so forth. And, you know, dealing with the manager of each group, you know, trying to, you know, try to get things set up. Uh, and I did that and wrote programs. And then, uh, I was put in charge and uh, I'll take over the production control part, production control coordination we named it, you know, which was involved in, we hired people, then they were assigned by project, right, to follow each project to make sure things happen on time, the right quality and cost level. So they were, we were quite successful in that. And, uh, and we had a good group of people and I'd just like to mention that uh, at one point, I guess it was the third year I was there, the, uh, for some reason they uh, put, put me under a, the purchasing manager, right? And uh, I, was, I was under Bill Steck, who was the plan manager, right? So, uh, and I, he was a nice guy too, Herb Hutchison. And uh, I guess I was with him maybe a year or less, and he called me office one day and he offered me the job. And he wanted me to take over the electrical buying job. Right, and I knew he wasn't happy with was electrical fire, and I didn't think too much of him either. But, uh, but the uh, manager, but uh, he, uh, I thought about it. But then I, what I thought was I had these people working for me a number of times. We developed a good system. Everybody loved, you know, loved this engineering project. Engineering by right, because we got the job done. And uh, I said, well, I'm not going, you know have some guy come here and mess this all up, they did all this work. So I told him no, you know. And so that was, and then I guess in the fifth year I decided I want to get back in the Camden area or in Morristown. I stayed in Morristown, lived in Morristown. So uh, I signed on with the, uh, the uh, project uh, called Red Eagle Red Fox. Okay. And uh, that was all, I was all new to I think the, the, the man in charge was a, uh, Osborne and Butler was in charge, and Bill Snack later came in, and that was related to you know this secure program. And one of the major things in that program was at that time the print, the multi-layer print boards were just coming into existence, right? And they're going through a lot of problems. You know, up to that time, I guess it was all a single or double-sided, and. Uh, and that was holding up the uh, production because they couldn't produce the 17 billion couldn't produce these boards uh, fast enough. So they had to set up another. They to satisfy the customer in the NSA. They set up a printing board facility in Morristown. So that became part of what we were doing. And uh, eventually we got out of the printing board problem. The only one thing I do remember, well, this is all going on. We said like I guess it's once a week meetings, great big meetings. And uh, I remember this chief engineer, I think his name was Waters, I'm not sure, but anyhow, 
I remember him constantly talking about this problem of the unit multilayer board and the problem that's got the one ohm resistance going through the hole. And the problem turned out to be the speed of the drill drilling the holes, dragging epoxy through with it, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, once they solved that problem, everything was kosher. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I guess uh, I was working on that, and then my, the chief financial, financial officer on the project asked me to go out to Morristown to close, to close out this for the board work because we're finishing up, and he wanted to close out you know, the cost, right, mm -hmm. the budget. So I went out there and I worked for a guy named Petrillo in the, in the Morristown project office. And uh, so that was, that was a decent experience. One thing I like to remember about that, my office here in the project, I was at the office, I was next to a, uh, an older gent who was a retired admiral. And we were, I was talking to him one day and he started talking about Malcorn. And evidently he was in the procurement part of the Navy, right, when he was in the Navy. And he used to say how Mount Carney was so well respected by the Navy that a handshake sealed the deal for a contract with the Navy who he was dealing with. And I always remember that for that. Because I think in the, in the early death of Mount Carney kind of messed up Camden a bit, right, you know. And also I think it had something to do with, with uh, RCA, G by an RCA. Uh, Mount Carney would never gave in to that, you know. But he died, I think he died in his 50s from leukemia. Uh, so, uh, so we're in Morristown, and then when I was in Morristown, uh, I stopped in to see Bill Sneck at the time one day, who was in the corporate staff. And he, uh, he said, hey, they're looking for somebody in a new program. And so he interested, I said, yeah. So uh, it was P3C. Mm -hmm. And so I went on an interview with a man by the name Al Kettler. Kettler. And uh, so I started working on P3C, I guess it was in 68, uh, and uh, because the first production was 69, I believe. And uh, they were building the, they had gone through the model, they were building the prototypes and trying to get production up. And it was in 13, 13 building. And the model shop, they had a model shop there, they were sort of the ones involved in everything then. I was eventually moved over to one building you know, into a manufacturing facility. Once you got into a production program, right, the manufacturing facility for production people kind of took over. So we're in one building and there's a, uh, and uh, that was, uh, that was a kind of an interesting experience because Al Keller was, uh, lost his job and uh, followed by Al Cattell took over who was actually a fab, uh, fabrication plant manager for years. And I, I was impressed with, with what he was doing, how he was operating. But he died tragically in a car accident. And then I think a guy by the name of Angel Angel took over. And eventually Rittenhouse, right? But anyhow, we got into production and uh, eventually, and uh, I was, I, I was, uh, I used to be there at nighttime I'm in the very beginning and Calling in, uh, calling in engineers when it was a problem and you know, getting something done, you know. Mm -hmm. And by to it, had the HF and he, he had a sign and he, a an engineer could do that. And the OHF manager too, I think it was Nata Bella. And I, I was, uh, I escorted the first USF radio from third, I think it's 13 building at the time, down the ramp in 17 building into the pack and ship area. Worried about falling off the dolly because we're going down like right on the way you're in that ramp or not. It was down like that yeah. between floors. I was, so that was uh, that was the first shipment on the UHF set. Mm -hmm. And UHF was a uh, the problem with the UH schedules was uh, I'll talk about both sets. I think it was the most major problem getting started up. But by the UHF it was the, tra the, the transmitter, 26 stage transmitter. These transistors were not doing good. They were always, you know, they were always not bad. And Bob Breeze was involved in that. He said he interviewed right? Mm -hmm. He came up eventually. He came up with a uh, when the transistor business quality got much better. He came up with some transistors. We brought it down to a five-stage transmitter, which was no problem after that with that with that transmitter. And also on the ASAP was a transmitter problem. 
That was a thousand watt transmitter. I think the UHF was a 100 watt. And they had a, a cooling system problem. And the heat exchanger, they couldn't build heat exchangers, didn't leak. <laughs> and uh, that got to be, you know, quite a problem. And uh, talking about going outside and all that, and I always believed, I never had anything to say. I always try to keep the work inside. If we had a good shop inside, like the printer board shop and the, uh, and the fab shop and so forth, right? the coil and transformer shop, I try to keep inside because it was much easier to deal with as far as problems and so forth, right? And, uh, but uh, so the, the uh, transmitter problem was, uh, I think, eventually solved. They got a better method of, uh, of inspecting it. But what they used to do when they had when they had when holes and leaks leaking out, they used to put some liquor in and slush it through to try to close it up. It didn't work too good. And they came up with a, a bronchoscope to do the inspection, find out where the holes were, and then use that bronchoscope to close up those holes. And the job was kept in the fab shop. And they did a very good job. Now, the good thing about the fab shop in your own in your own house is that if there was something you wouldn't have built. You could take your prints over there and get an estimate right off the manager at that time, right, you know, and know where you're standing and what it can do. So, so that uh, pretty much, I guess the next milestone, one of the milestones in P3C was the 10 years of continuous production. And that, I guess that was 79. And uh, so I said, well, we, gotta, we have to have a party, right, you know, for people who are working on this all this time, right? And so I, uh, ordered a cake for my uh, daughter-in-law's father, who was a baker in South Philly. Uh, what they call, uh, what's that called? The uh, cake, the the flat cake, cake, right? Yeah. Sheet cake, yes. And I made a great big sheet cake, and, and I ordered, went over with my secretary and picked it up and came back. We had the party in the, in the manufacturing shop. And, uh, and the people really enjoyed it, you know, because they, they were part of you know, the success. The success. One of the things that you find out as a line supervisor, production supervisor, is they really listen to the people who work for you. Because a lot of them have good ideas on how to do something different, right? And that's where the suggestion program is important, right? If someone had an idea, or say had a suggestion program, you write it up and it would be evaluated. And if it was evaluated, if it was used, then you got rewarded, you got money for that suggestion. But the people who built the stuff, in fact, the engineers probably say this all the time, because the follow-up engineers always in the factory, and they, they deal with the, per the supervisor and with the person building it, right? And so they, they get thirsty, and a lot of these people, well, you have to remember that they're sitting in this position building this thing for so every day, right, you know, or, or the parts of it or something. So they're the most familiar with that, you know? So as a supervisor, you have to understand that, right? And you have to understand who's good at it and who's not too good at it, you know? So the, that, that went off very fine. There's a couple of instances uh, through the program I thought was unique. We had a UHF radio one time that they couldn't get chipped, right? It kept failing. Well, it would pass production tests, QC tests, but fail in DCAS tests, right? So they couldn't get shipped and they didn't do it, and this is after months, right? So, so uh, they didn't want to throw it away, right? That's what, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 rated. And uh, so I came up with an idea, and I don't know whether it was me or Tanya Harris, the quality guy, but we got together, and I, I drove a pickup truck, and uh, he got a, he got a, by, Tom got a pad of rubber pad and put in the back of my deck, like, my panel, my truck, right, my pickup truck. Put the radio on it, stood and stayed with it on, on the back, right, and then I then drove it over, I guess, to Front Street, with all those cobblestones mm -hmm. for two or three blocks. Drove it back, took it inside. Eventually, it passed, right. <laughs> and they're bouncing around a little bit, you know. <laughs> so I can't remember that because that was kind of a unique thing. Mm -hmm. The other thing, I, from a people relationship and working with people, I had a hobby of propagating plants, and I was into, in fact, it started in RCA when uh, some secretary had a velvet plant there I saw one day. I asked her what it was, and 
she developed a plan. Then she said, do you want a piece of it? And I said, yeah. You can propagate it just by rooting it, by just putting it in water. So I started, that's how I started on house plants. And I had a, my oldest son was in agriculture. He, I think he was uh, in college at the, the Del Valley University studying what about the horticulture, horticulture. So he was interested in, you know, helping me. And so I got started in that. So I had a lot of house plants, you know, in various stages. At one time I tried to see how many, maybe three times, three different crops, right? Three different times of the year. But I decided to bring a lot of these into the factory and get one to each factory person, right? So they seem to appreciate that because that worked out good. And I guess the other thing in, as far as project management, trying to get things done, is uh, there, was a, uh, there was a gal who was a professor at uh, Glassboro State who hired on in marketing at RCA. And uh, they asked me, my boys asked me if, if it was okay if she went with me over to a factory meeting. And this particular meeting, I forget what the problem was, but it was, it was kind of a serious problem, production problem. And then everybody was there, all the manufacturing people, and the, uh, you know, all the management people, process engineering, and engineering was there, design engineering. And uh, I did, I had a secretary, my secretary get some red pencils and put a red pennant at the top of it, right, cut out a red pennant. Just to show, like it was kind of a hot thing, right? <laughs> so I put that in front of his position right before he came in, and uh, so we started discussing. We weren't getting anywhere. The so boy wanted to pick up, you know, to get it done, right? Whatever. I forget what it was, right? And eventually, after a half hour going back and forth with the different management guys in the meeting, I said, uh, "Look, I'll i want to take care of this, or something like that." You're like, "Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll make sure this happens, right, or something." And uh, right after that, one of the managers, I think he was the process engineering manager, Marie Scalica, uh, he came up and started talking about, you know, how they're going to take care of this, right? And what I want to mention was the gal said that that's the first time you ever show anything like that, where nothing was happening, right, right? Then all of a sudden, right, somebody's going to do it, you know? So I kind of always remember that because uh, and uh, and as time went by, uh, by with our says years go by, get it, get into the early 80s, and things start changing, top management changing, and so forth, and uh, and things are getting a little more so more stagnant, and a lot of challenges. And uh, so when 86 came or 85, I decided I was going to retire in 86. I would be 64. I was going to, I was going to wait to 65, but then the story was GE was buying RCA, so I thought I'd get out before GE took over. And uh, well, one of the reasons, you know, plus my mother had her in a home and I want to spend more time with her. You said and, 65, and, you meant 85, right? Oh, I meant my age. Oh, okay. Your, my, your age was 65. Well, yeah, okay. so I'm retiring at 65. Okay. And, uh, but it wasn't just a... It wasn't just G was taking over. I, I was, you know, I wanted to leave. Plus, my mother. I want to spend more time with my mother, and uh, so I retired in the, uh, uh, retired in the '86, April the first '86. One thing I, I forgot to mention, I think it's worth well noting. I used to carpool with a, an engineering manager by the name of Bob Holston. On the way, knew Bob. He's a mechanical engineer. And he was then we were we used to go out each of his wife and my wife we used to go to different places at night. And uh, but we carpooled for fifteen years. And um, he lived in Morristown. He told me one time when he when his retirement he told the people something I had said one day when we used to talk on the work and so forth, you know. And uh, talk about work, you know, getting that get this done and that done and so forth. So he told me, he told, because he never forgot this, he told the people he, that he said that he, how he got motivated going to work is when they're talking with me, at the very end we're going to go into the plant, I would say to him, let's go get those bastards, right? <laughs> now, not mean anything bad, but you know, let's, let's, let's get after him, right? And he said he never forgot that, and it really motivated him. 
He told his retirement. He told me he told this at his retirement. He never did forget it. He, met, he brought that up in his interview. Did he? So, yes. Are you interviewed Bob? Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh yes. good. Yeah, Bob's the I haven't seen him for a while. Mm -hmm. Dora, did we, uh, yeah, we, and his wife, Pearl, was, yeah. she was uh, excellent. She always. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about that. Let's talk about your co-workers. What were they like? Well, if, if I talk, if I talk about my start, right, when I started, and I'll start there, right? right? I got in, I, I came into a uh, night shift, right? And uh, one of the things I found out real fast, right? Everything gets played to the night shift, okay? Sure. And uh, so, it was a long, and my, the, the supervisor did my job in the daytime was an ex-Marine named Stalmer, Palmer Stern. And we got along good enough, but I was getting tired of, when I come in at night, his boss always told me about things that went wrong and it was our fault, right? So what I did was, I started coming in two hours early. And I started, you know, looking into everything, you know. And pretty soon, all these night shift problems started disappearing, mm. you know. And uh, so, that's, that's, how I, that's one thing I learned real fast. I, and I had the, the respect I had for the people working on the job was tremendous. Mm -hmm. They treated us a new guy, a young guy treated me real well, right? You know, the people. And what I found out is if you're, you can be firm and honest and make sure the job, if they're doing the job, but as long as you're honest and you treat them fairly, they'll respect you. You cannot compromise yourself as a supervisor, what I learned, right? Early on, and I've seen cases of that happening. In other words, you cannot favor one person on the line because she's good looking or she's got a good personality and let her get away with bad work, okay? Because that's going to catch up with you. And so you can't do that. And that's what I learned there, right? It sounds like you did a fair amount of socializing with the people that you worked with. Yes, it, it, it was, uh, I made a lot of good friends. I mean, there's things like, I can recall, as an example, I think, but I forget his occupation now, but he lived down somewhere, some middle or something, and uh, he put me on to, to a, uh, a butcher down there, a farmer who butcher, butchered his own cow, and uh, cows, calves. So I went down there and got half a calf, right? And another guy, another fella, I think he had, um, he had fowl, you know, chickens and so forth. And one of my younger, my youngest boy, who is the one now here, he was only, he was very young into animals and chickens and stuff. And he was telling me about chicken feed, how he gets it for nothing. So I met him one day someplace on a railroad car, open box car, and what he was doing was scraping out all this uh, the chicken feet, right? Mm -hmm. That it fell out of the bags and so forth, right? Oh no, he had pigs. Okay, he was he was feeding his pigs, right? <laughs> so, you know, so I, you know, and then I I've, I've been in a company of several other people. Marie Carr, in particularly, she loved the kids. I, I knew where she lived. I visited her even after I retired. I visited her, and uh, I used to send Christmas cards, and then visit visit her down. There. She had a place in a. Next to Seattle City, uh, I forget the name of it now, but so I had the relationship there, and um, and we used to, I, I've got one story as far as one story about components. We used to, I guess it was once a month, I don't think it's once a week, but we had management meetings mm -hmm. at Murray's restaurant. They used to be right across from City Hall, and we had it on the second floor. They set up the second floor for us, right? So we had the dinner, and I always remember Sam McGee, who was uh, one of the engineers and components. Well, I remember him because he put ketchup on everything, including ice cream. But the big thing about that, <laughs> big thing about that, I mean, after was dinner was over, clear everything away, and out come the cards and dice. You should shoot crap against the wall and play the cards of you. Know, on the tables. So that was that was kind of it. I never I wasn't much a card player or crap. I think I never played I never played crap, even in was in the Navy. But uh, I used to do that board ship too. 
What about uh, your supervisors? Well, I, I respect, respect wise, I'll, I'll talk about, uh, I learned a lot from uh, Al Egner, who actually was a former horse control guy, uh, very mild mannered gentleman. Eddie Cohn, who was an experienced general foreman in Transformers, and we were very, we went out a lot together, Eddie Cohn and I. And uh, a lot of respect for, I had respect for them. And then I worked for Joe Cucci for a short time. He was a Transformer manager too, I had respect for him. And in, in, in the one year I worked in, in the uh, Yokes, they call it Yokes, there was uh, the guy I worked for directly at night time. Well, actually, I don't think I ever worked for anybody directly at night time. Uh, but Wally Brooks was in the day guy was in charge of me. Of me. I'd see him, I'd call him. But uh, so I, and uh, Pete Bone would hang around. He was a head, head four guy. He'd hang around at night. And I guess you could say I worked for him. He'd hang around a little bit. But I never had any problems with him. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of respect for him. And I went to, uh, went to Morristown. I worked for, uh, well, I guess I worked for a guy I didn't have a lot of respect for because I didn't think, well, it wasn't any, he wasn't that bad, but I didn't just think he was, you know, as good as the others. So uh, I, I don't know, I think his name might have been Mulligan, I'm not sure. I worked for a guy named Tucker, a lot of respect for him. And particularly Bill Butler, I worked for him. Uh, he knew a lot, got you in trouble. He was tough. When I, when I was on that B Muse program with him, one of the responsibilities was he had making up these uh, different instructions which involved engineering, where engineering had to do this, this, that, and the other thing. And most engineering managers weren't used to that, right? And he, he was pretty rough, Bill. So we'd go in there and set it up. Then I had to go in and have asked the guy to sign it, right? You know, the manager. That was tough because he wasn't feeling too good about it, you know. <laughs> but, uh, and I had a lot of respect for him. And see, I worked for him. And, and now I guess, then I, when I went to Heightstown, uh, I worked for Bill Snack came in after Bill Butler left. I had a lot of respect for him. He was good. He was an experienced product guy, manufacturing guy. Did you feel that they valued your work? Uh, well, when I was first started there at Morristown, right, mm -hmm. I thought there was just too much, too many guys come in from Camden, too many people were boiled my over me were from Camden, right? Mm -hmm. And I was from a different part of Camden, components. Nobody knew me, right, right, you know? So I didn't think there was a lot of chance for me, right? Mm -hmm. But I think they always respected what I did, right, you know? Okay. And uh, so the uh, so Morristown Heights, Morristown, I guess, and Phil Sneck in Heightstown was was uh, a lot of respect for. And then they Bill brought in a fellow, an old uh, fabrication manager from the West Coast, by the name of uh, Carrick, Jack Carrick, big, tall, white hair guy, good guy. Uh, brought him in uh, over me as a boss, right? Now he knew nothing about what we had been doing for like all these years right there. And and I was, I guess, I was kind of protective of what we developed. Didn't want anybody messing it up, right? So I had a, maybe a couple things, he finally got a lot of respect for him, but he said one thing to me one time, and I don't, I can't remember exactly what it was, but he called me in the office and he was upset about something. And I think it's mostly he's upset about it. He's getting all these good vibes about what we do from all the project and engineering people, right? And he's like not part of it, right, you know? Uh, so he said something like that, and I don't know what he said. He said something like, you know, if it wasn't for your large family or you having five kids, that he was going to like, you know, do something. And I said to him something like, well, you, don't you ever say that to me again. Don't ever mention my family again, why, why you want to make a decision, right, you know? And, after that, everything cleared up, right. became pals. I visited him up in, uh, when he re after he retired, he was still working in Salt. I visited him up in uh, New Hampshire. One time we were up in the main area. <laughs> so 
you know, you know, it all worked out good. He could not, one thing he said to me, and this guy didn't work for me, he brought a guy in by, I think his name was McGonagall, who was a materials, supposed to be a materials manager, and we had a lot of good, experienced material people working there, management people. He brought him in, and he didn't know his, didn't know a lot, right? But Carrick used to say, and I didn't have any respect for him at all. I mean, I never had any confrontation with him, but I just didn't have any respect. He was eventually fired for not being able to do the job, you know, of not my making. But you so, had a little, a brief encounter with Jack Shannon too, didn't you? Oh yeah, Jack Shannon. Yeah, Jack Shannon. He, and when, when, when I was on a, on the P three C, he uh, came out one day. I happened to be outside my office. He came out and was all excited, and said, "Hey, uh, I want you to uh, stop stop your work in the in the lead dress section." Because you you know you're interfering with my program you know and he's all excited because we're getting our work done and he's not their program small terminal is not getting it done right and so I listened to him and he said I want you to go down there and stop that right something like that you know stop that right so that's you know how Shadow was up that and he uh, uh, so I went down and I went to the, man, the supervisor of the section down there lead dress. And I asked him, you know, how come and so forth, you know, this is... Well, he said it was only because Woody, who worked on P3C over at Manufacturing, was doing a better follow-up job and making sure they knew he wanted certain things at certain times and all that. And the guy that was working for Small Terminal wasn't doing that, right, you know? So I come back and told Shannon, he didn't say nothing, right? <laughs> you know, he understood. And, he didn't, and I didn't say anything about stopping him or anything. Mm -hmm. I didn't stop nothing, right? Hmm. You know? Yeah. But uh, but Shannon, I was in meetings with Shannon. I had side respect for Shannon in a way because even though I think he was always trying to show show that he was the boss, you know. Oh yeah. And uh, but he there was a fella, another guy. He called me. I used to he used to review every morning when it was a certain problem or something. He wanted to review it. So I would be there every morning. And I was prepared. But another guy, another manager from another section who was involved, I'm trying to remember, I can't really remember his name. He was always coming late and not prepared, mm. right? That didn't sit well with Shannon. No. He beat him up awful. You know, you know what I mean? So, so, you know, you have to, I have to respect people who, who want, to, want people to do their jobs and get it done and be prepared and so forth, you know. So, you had quite a career at RCA. Um, well, I was very, I was very fortunate. Well, I, I know I have to tell you, I was fortunate because it came at the time I needed a job. Oh, good. And, uh, and it was about answering an ad in the paper, right? And mm -hmm. the reason why I needed a job is because I come out of maybe, and I went to, I had an industrial course in high school, so I had to make up academic credits, so I went to Brown Prep. And I decided I studied very hard, mm -hmm. hard enough that I made the honor roll all the time. I was a Valedict president, Valedictorian, you know. So I was doing all that to get into college, right? I was going to go to Villanova. And uh, at the same time, I played on the baseball team. I was, I was a baseball player, so I played third base. And uh, so my father had uh, bought this diner, which he's never been in the business. I used to help out there, and then he decided it wasn't for him. And, decided to start a business and he leaned on me to you know, you know, help him. You know, so mm -hmm. I sort of gave up on the college and we started a coil and, wire, coil and transformer business, electric oil transformers in a basement in the house in Mayfair. And then we and we're going to, he decided that uh, we're going to do oil burner transformers. And just when we got the first one up that business went down. And about that time, I think around 48, 49, things were starting to go down. So uh, we, we uh, and then we had, we had he, he built a uh, vacuum, the uh, infrared, the infrared tube, uh, baking oven, mm -hmm. to bake the grills and so forth. That gave off a lot of stuff. Next door neighbor complained. We had to get out of there, so we moved to Kensington in a garage where a coal, coal, I had a coal business. We had the second and third floor, no heat. 
by in the winter times. <laughs> and we had a went up to Oyster Bay, New York, and bought a, a coil winding machine. And then uh, we wound the primary, the secondary coils on that. The primary coils we used up a, a, a wood lathe, made the mandrels up on wood lathe to wind the primaries and you know the heavy wires that we had built at the time, uh, replacing the, the, the power distribution transformer coils. Right. Uh, the guy had a business of the old ones, cleaning out all the fluid, taking all the windings out, and making new windings. Right. We were doing the windings. And the way we did that was that the heavy coil was uh, about a quarter inch square, thick with cotton cover. The big rawhide hammer, hammer, right, a foot pedal, right, the start and stop, and holding the wire and banging, forming around the mandrel, right, you know. So uh, that was that was kind of interesting. But it got to the point where I didn't see that see that going well for me, and I, as I said in the book I wrote, I fell in love, and. Uh, I decided my wife was really to raise in the family, not becoming making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So you went to work for RCA. Yeah. Because you needed a job. That's right. And you stayed there how many years? Thirty-six. Just because you needed a job. Yeah. Why did you stay there that long? Well, it was such a nice place to work, and it was very fortunate. I worked with good people. Mm -hmm. They treated you. Everybody was treated well. Okay. Once you gained a position, like I worked up from, I'd say. Uh, the supervisor, the foreman, uh, the administrator, one of them, the projects, mm -hmm. then manager. Well, I maintained that manager position to the end of my, you know, my mm -hmm. career, right? You know. So, if I asked you to sum up your career at RCA, would you tell me it was just a job? Oh no, absolutely not. What would you tell? Me? It was. Uh, it was the uh, best experience of my life. I enjoyed every part of it. I I can't think of anything I, I really, you know, did enjoy. And, and nothing it was never a job to me. What was the best thing about working for RCA? The best thing I think was uh, the people to work for you, as far as being a management person. Mm -hmm. Having their respect and be able to get things done. My my big thing was getting things done. Uh, I stayed in that kind of area, like for instance, I could never see myself if I was offered a position as a vice president, for example. Mm -hmm. yeah. But my experience, I couldn't see myself doing that mm -hmm. because it was like it wasn't the same thing as getting something done. What but, was the worst thing about working for RCA? I don't think there was any worse thing. Okay. I don't. I don't think. I have to say I enjoyed every you know part of it. But I had I had different problems, got involved, you know, involved in different things, mm -hmm. but there was nothing that I didn't couldn't handle, right? And I didn't, you know, and I I really enjoyed it. It was uh, it, what it did for me was gave me my goal, the raising a family, mm -hmm. right? We raised five children, yeah. and we had fifteen grandchildren. Super. And so that's. All right, John, is there any other? Recollections or stories or anything that we haven't covered? I, uh, I don't, I don't think so. It's just, uh, uh, I appreciate this. Uh, you know, I don't know whether I express myself or not about it enough, but uh, appreciate the opportunity. To, yeah. You know. Yeah, you did very well, and I appreciate uh, you letting us into your home so that we can come and do this interview. Yeah. Um, we'll combine it with all the other interviews, and we'll end up with a history of RCA. Yeah. Sure. Well, it was a very fine, very fine company. It's a shame, like I think I said in the, it was a shame that Mal Carney died when he did, mm. because he was a really the guy that pushed. Camden and a manufacturing people. He had come from manufacturing, right? Mm -hmm. And he was good. And uh, but it was a shame because he got people eventually in there didn't know what they were doing. And uh, I'm all I'm saying, you know, they, they kind of don't know what they're doing. But uh, 